This interview is brought to you in association with Rabobank. Hello, and welcome to another of Rural Delivery's online interviews, where we talk to the people who are leading change in New Zealand's primary sector. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Bruce Campbell, Chief Operating Officer of Plant and Food Research, who will soon be heading to Asia to present on future trends at a major fresh produce conference. Bruce, good to talk to you. Oh, good to be here, Roger. Well, you're actually, you're not here. You're in Brisbane uh, at a science conference, I understand. Thanks for making the time. No, no problem at all. I'm calling in in the middle of the conference. It's a very exciting time for horticulturalists from all around the world as we uh, share a lot of information about what the future of horticulture is going to look like. And what sort of future are you picking then? There's been some excellent presentations uh, that have been here and it's very much about how people in the world are going to have different demands for their food and how that will shape the sort of things that they're going to buy in the future. Now the sort of buyers that New Zealand's focused up on at the moment, let's face it, is Asia. Plant and food research, I understand, has a strong focus on that part of the world. Why Asia for PFR? Look, uh, Roger, it's increasingly where our customers are. New Zealand exported something like 3.6 billion of horticultural products uh, last year and over a billion of that went to Asia. It's also uh, important that it's a value question for us and uh, those are the countries in Asia where our crops are earning a premium. So uh, it's sensible that we put an increasing focus on that. Okay, so the marketing side's pretty straightforward. They're buying a lot, paying good money for it. What's the link to the science? For us, it's, uh, as I um, mentioned about this conference I'm at right at the moment, it's about getting close to the market and thinking about what sort of products our Asian consumers are going to want and pay that premium for in the future. And as well as helping us to design how to grow and pack and market those products, it'll allow us to really shape the way that that premium will be achieved in the future. We're not doing too badly at the moment though, right? I mean, who's getting it right at the moment? Well, we're calling it a pathway to premium, Roger, and um, we've got some good runs on the board, but there's still a lot to be learnt. Uh, th some of the um, people that are doing the best job at the moment, not surprisingly, are our big sectors, and that's like the wine industry and kiwi fruit that we do a lot of work with. And Zespri have really taken that to quite a deep level, looking at sensory science and fruit marketing, and actually using that to feed right back through to guide the breeding program for kiwi fruit. Can, it's an interesting expression, this pathway to premium. Can you, can you sort of tease that out a bit? Tell us a little bit more about what's actually involved. Well, look, there's a lot of trends out there at the moment, and uh, we know that Asian consumers really like our food, but we don't know a lot about why. Uh, we've got, obviously, a very good clean green image, and that's um, undoubtedly a part of it. Um, but we know that food safety is important, and we're also just trying to anticipate how the the household buyer, how the person that's the gateway into households in Asia is going to change the way they'll buy products in the future. Think about how we're going to design for those sort of changes. Is anyone doing a good job of that now? Well, yes. The, um, the larger sectors are actually doing a good job. So wine industry and Zespri, who we do a lot of work with. And in the case of Zespri, they've actually taken that to a, quite a significant new level of looking at quite deep sensory science and fruit marketing. And through that, uh, we're using that information to work in partnership with Zespri to design new types of cultivars that will be wanted in the future and that will achieve a premium. Who else is, I guess, going to be a fast folly, do you think, sort of breaking into this space after the big boys have already got there? Well, we're already seeing a trend in that, that the emerging sectors like avocados are gearing up around growth in Asia. And there's some very interesting other examples, and one that I'm particularly interested in at the moment is the whole area of Māori. Okay, so in, in, with any particular crop or? Well, in whichever crop uh, Māori get involved with, the important thing is there's a very close affinity with the way that pe Chinese people and Māori people think and that understanding of long-term partnerships is part of it. So I think Māori could develop a very strong brand if they act collectively and build on that cultural understanding. It's interesting. Now, uh, what are sort of the trends that you're actually seeing in China when it comes to premium foods, and how are you translating those to what the horticultural sector needs to be thinking about? Well, right now there's a number of trends that are, quite a lot of them are, are a lot like in the West, actually, but there are some subtle differences. So you're talking about health and functionality and novelty, and food safety is obviously huge. And to an extent, that's why we haven't seen the biolocal trend, which you see in the US and Europe, or even Japan these days. 
China's changing the way it's thinking, though, and uh, I think it's going to move into an era where there's a lot more attention to care for the environment in China, more about remediation of land and air and water, and that's going to open opportunities as China becomes less dependent on self-sufficiency in food and is more open to importing food from other markets. Do you think that the big trend, say, towards convenience that we've seen uh, in the West that's driven a whole lot of packaging and, and, and very um, uh, sophisticated formulation of food and delivery of food and advertising, everything that goes around it, is that going to also occur across China? I was just at a very interesting presentation this morning talking about exactly this and talking about what convenience really means. And it's, it's a lot more than just something being convenient. It's actually about the person preparing the food in that household actually having comfort that they, it's easy for them because they're time poor and also that they're confident that they can prepare a good quality product from what they're purchasing. So there's a lot for us to think about as people become increasingly focused on using their time effectively and making sure that they're developing a really great meal for themselves or their family. Uh, those are trends that we should focus really carefully on in the fresh produce area because we maybe got a way to go yet. There's a big focus on uh, how diets are changing as um, China becomes more westernised and as uh, uh, people's household incomes increase. Do you think it's going to follow the same sort of path that we saw happen in the United States or in Europe as that happened or even in, in, in Japan post World War II? Or are we going to look at perhaps a, a different evolution of, of people's eating habits? Well, meat consumption in China is definitely increasing at the moment. And there's some thinking that it might uh, level off around 2025 or so. And uh, really, it's, um, it's a bit of crystal ball gazing to see what might happen after that. But there are some subtle differences between China and Western thinking around food. Chinese people have a very long tradition of managing their health through uh, food that they would eat. And also, uh, there's going to be quite a significant health issue in the future, probably if we see overconsumption trends in food like we've seen in the West. Um, China's quite a different society, so there's an interesting open question whether you might see more central intervention in the kind of diets that people are having and more management of those potential health costs. Mm. So that becomes quite a grey area, but uh, it may be that it takes a different trajectory from what we've seen in the West as people become wealthier. Because mm. in the West, it's the supermarkets that are all powerful. Are you suggesting that may not be the way it is in China? Well, supermarkets are definitely expanding at the moment and have a very good offering in higher quality food in China. Uh, Chinese have shown that they're very uh, adept at actually jumping technologies and moving on to the next one. We saw that very much with uh, not actually investing in copper for communications with the telephone, but jumping straight into mobile phones. So we're seeing a similar trend starting to develop now in online shopping. There's a lot of people in these mega cities that have got time on their hands and wanting to be very connected out to the world and could well, through their mobile phone or their computer, be tapping into food stories, food issues all around the world, and then making choices to buy online as a, as a result, with online shopping really got the potential to take off as a major trend in China in the future. Okay, so, so what does this mean for the science? How much science are you having to now do in market versus how much you can do in New Zealand in order to, I guess, help build this pathway to premium? We're doing a combination of both. Obviously, we're working onshore and working closely with our New Zealand industry partners in that to think about those Chinese markets. But we're also working directly in partnership with Chinese researchers up in China as part of that wider picture. And that is actually uh, creating some quite significant new opportunities for us, which we're really leveraging off some long-standing relationships we have with a number of very good quality Chinese research groups that we've developed over the last 20 years or so. So it's going to be a combination of onshore work and work directly in China so we can better understand how those trends are developing because some of them are going to happen real fast. Now, you mentioned some um, earlier what you called some quite deep uh, sensory-type research. What does that sort of thing involve? You mentioned that Zespri had been involved in it. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a significant part of really getting intimate with the consumer and knowing what they want. Taste is going to be part of it expectations for health will be part of it, and this whole convenience and packaging trend is something we don't know that much about, but we want to kind of guide our producers here in New Zealand on what might 
be important trends for them in the fresh produce area. So that means working up in Singapore, we've got partnerships up in there. It means working in with people in China and in market in China to interface the science with what consumers are really wanting. It's tough though, isn't it? Because uh, you're, you're always told, get to know your market, get to know your customer. Um, in this case, we often, you know, we don't even know what they're saying, let's be honest, the, the uh, language barrier is a significant one, let alone distance. Um, how are people going around, I guess, getting through that layer before they can even dig down to actually what it's like to be an everyday Chinese consumer and understand what they want? Yeah, look, you're exactly right, Roger, and a big part of that is actually through being on the ground, be local. It's a, it's a well understood uh, way of being successful in China now. Get uh, close with your people that are on the ground locally, work partnerships with them to really understand what's happening in that particular region. Chinese, Chinese uh, opportunities are very diverse, and so you really do have to put in the work to build your local connections and truly understand what's happening in market. Well, you're going to be there, of course, uh, as I said in my introduction, you're going to be there uh, uh, beginning of next month. What's going to be your message for that assembled group of, of, uh, of uh, horticultural trade professionals? The, the big message I'm going to be giving in that talk, Roger, is no, don't just think about the individual product that you're developing right now. Take an opportunity to really look at the big picture of what's changing and especially build the consumer and what they're going to do into your thinking and how they might change in the future and what they might do. So we're better prepared to anticipate what the future is going to look like and position for that. Sounds great. Look, Bruce, thanks very much for sparing some time. I'll let you get back to your conference. Great. Okay. Thanks very much, Roger. Cheers. Bye-bye. This interview was brought to you in association with Rabobank.